everyone. So in my last video, I said I would show you how to make an engine from scratch and here it is in all of its simplistic glory. Of course, there is stuff behind all of these, but I didn't want to overwhelm us too quickly. Uh, this won't be a tutorial or a series, but a quick video to help you wrap your mind around how to get started on such a gargantuan project like making a game engine. Uh, it won't be 100% from scratch. You can see we're using OpenGL, but all OpenGL does for us is make windows and render the graphics, but we have to do all the heavy lifting. So this is a great way to practice C++. You'll learn a lot about linear algebra, physics, graphics, 3D math, all highly applicable skills, not just to making games, but to technology and the world at large. Aren't you excited? Okay, so let's look at what all of this amounted to. Okay, here's our little test queue. And all I've done is I've made it so that it can accelerate and decelerate in one dimensional motion, but it's still in 3D space. So this is all defined in 3D, but right now it just moves along a line. Now it would be pretty trivial for me to have the same kind of motion if I pressed uh, the left and right keys uh, along this axis, that would be pretty trivial. And then also moving up and down with some other keys, but what we want is for the cube to have smooth movement so that if we combined up, which is what I'm pressing now, or W, and D, or right, that the cube would kind of arc and have smoother movement. And then an even further goal would have it be like a third or first person view where we have the camera follow the cube and we move around with our mouse and WASD. So you can see all the different ways we can improve and I can show you why we're actually not so far off from that. Now to prove to you that this is a 3D cube, we can zoom and then we've kind of zoomed backwards. So this is the other side of the cube. This is to prove to you there are six different colors, one, two, three, and then four, five, six. So it is a cube in 3D, but I don't yet have a way where you can click and drag and rotate it because that's all the stuff we have to define by ourselves. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you take for granted in a real commercial engine is that you're so used to just being able to rotate objects, place them, but we can't do that. We have to make all of those systems ourselves. So this video is basically an application of all the stuff I went over in my graphics and engine videos. If you remember, 3D graphics are defined by points and vectors and matrices, which requires some knowledge of linear algebra. So first we're gonna look at that, make our own math library, and then we're gonna set up OpenGL, look at the flow of how it kind of renders things, and then we'll take a look at all the different places you can go from here and how um, this actually isn't too far off from something that looks almost like a game. Okay, so uh, the very first thing I did when I opened this up and I just had a blank screen is I made my own vector class. Now we're trying to make as much of our own code as possible. We don't want to rely on libraries and maybe if we're ambitious, one day we can replace OpenGL with our own code and feel very good about ourselves, but for now, we're gonna make a vector class. And this is really standard. If you're new to C++, this is a really standard way to initialize a class. You have your uh, constructors overloaded operator equals, which just lets us set two vectors equal to each other. But really all it is, it's a way for us to store an X, Y, and Z coordinate very elegantly. And then the next thing is making a matrix class. So we won't use these in this video yet, but you'll see why they're very relevant soon. Uh, and a matrix is just a grid of numbers. So we have our rows and our columns. Uh, you can change this size. That was just a placeholder. And really all we need is to be able to get a value, like get value ij, and set some value to some position in the matrix. Uh, so once again, good C++ practice, but the real interesting stuff is in our math library. So we don't wanna rely on any C++ math or algorithms library, so we're going to make our own. And some of this 
you may already know, but I find I always prefer a stupid easy explanation rather than someone going too fast and sounding smart or trying to sound smart. So we'll just go through it together. Uh, the first thing we need is some way to add two vectors. So it takes a vector a and a vector b, and all it does is say add a's x and b's x, put that in the new vectors x and so on, and we return that. Same with subtraction, b minus a, but of the individual components, we can't just directly say b minus a. Now, another more elegant way to do this is if in the vector 3D class, you overlay, <laughs> overloaded the operator plus and the operator minus so that you could just write b minus a directly, but this is kind of an easier to implement way. And then we have multiply, but maybe this name should be more descriptive because we're multiplying by a scalar, meaning if we have a vector a and we multiply it by two, so if a is one, 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 and multiply that by two, it'll be two, two, two. And then this is where things get interesting and useful. We have the dot product. And the dot product is basically projecting a onto b. And I made a little visual for you guys, but the reason why this is useful is because we can easily find the angle between two vectors uh, just by finding its dot product. And now I'll show you guys. So you can see we have vector a is one half, one half, zero. Vector b is one, zero, zero. And a dot b is this white line over here. It's as if we just are looking at the shadow that this vector is casting on this one. And so we can use this line to then find the angle between them, which you can imagine will be useful in graphics. Next, we have the cross product, which is a little bit more complicated. I tried to make a descriptive comment to show you what's going on. Uh, basically, the cross product, you have A and B, A cross B finds a vector that is perpendicular to both of them, meaning they all form a 90 degree angle. And we can also use this to find the angle between them because A cross B equals magnitude of A times magnitude of B sine theta. And I'll show you how to get the magnitude as well. So we also have a cross product demonstration. So I took the cross product of these two vectors right here. And so we have one, two, and then a third one that's perpendicular to both of those. So this is just to give you a visual of what's happening. And this is also particularly useful when you wanna find a vector like going out of the face of a mesh or something like that. Also very useful in graphics. And then we have some other useful tools like the absolute value. I made my own square root with Newton's method. Uh, I looked that up for some fun stuff. And then getting the magnitude of a vector is as simple as taking the sum of the squares of its components and then square rooting it. Let's get to the real stuff, shall we? You can see that I've dumped everything into my main.cpp file, which is not a good thing. Eventually, we'd like all of this to be extracted into nice, neat little packages and classes just like these over here, but we're learning, right? We're using this as a learning tool, and it's so easy to get caught up in trying to make something perfect. So first, we'll make something that works, and then I hope you think about different ways you could improve on this code. For example, you see, I've organized these a little bit, but you see we have all these global variables that are defining our cube. Well, this is just screaming to be in some kind of cube class, which could inherit from a shape class. And then if we add an object manager, we could just create a new cube and have its memory managed. Oh man, my mind's going everywhere. But for now, let's just take a look at how we're going to make our cube appear. First, we have a bool telling us if our cube is moving or not, and then its speed. These are pretty straightforward, just a number for the speed a bool for whether it's moving or not. We have the scale, which is its size, uh, its position, where it is, its forward vector, which way it's facing. And then we have a whole mess of vertices, which are the points that are defining it. So we have six faces and four points for each face. So we have 24 of them. Now you should stay away from using these magic numbers as they say, 
but uh, it seems kind of obvious that if you were going to have a cube, you would have four vertices for six faces. And then we have cube colors, which is a list of colors that we used for each of the faces in RGB format. So you can see we have one, this would be red, one zero zero is red, zero one zero, you only have one in the green, zero for red, zero for blue, so this will be green, this will be blue, and then the rest are the magenta, cyan, and yellow. And then zero 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 and one 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 are just white and black. So th those are color basics in programming. And then we have other stuff, but let's look at how our cube is going to happen. So in OpenGL, we do this thing where we say GL begin a GL polygon, sometimes it'll be a GL triangle, and then we set a color if we want, and then we set our vertices that are going to define the polygon, and then we say GL end. So we are going to make a polygon for each of the six faces. So once again, the six could be a variable called faces. And then for each face, it'll have four vertices. So you can see how I'm accessing it. I times four plus J. Uh, you can do that math in your head, but this is just a quick way to go through all of our vertices. And then we just make a bunch of those blocks. We draw all of our faces. And it's important to have these stored in this way instead of just writing out each GL begin, GL end block manually. It's important to have this stored so that we can update it. So let's take a look at how the cube is moved. So you can see in our timer, which is called every single frame, if the cube is moving, then we move it. Otherwise, we stop it. So let's look at what happens when it's moving. It first calls a function called limit speed. And I have a variable defined as max speed. And this is if we press the up key for a long time, it couldn't end up going like a thousand units a second or something. And then it just speeds off the page and we'll never see it again. So this makes sure that it's set to a reasonable speed and stays there at a constant rate. Uh, and then after we limit the speed, what we're doing is we're taking the direction, we're finding the change in its position, and we're updating it. And that's where we translate all the vertices. This isn't implemented yet, by the way. We'll talk about how the camera can follow it. But now let's take a look at translate vertices. So this is our list of cube cube verts above and all we're doing is adding that delta or that change we calculated to every single vertex of the cube and that's why we're seeing it move forward so you probably have developed this intuition if you've done unity or things like that but it's just kind of cool to me that we're doing it at this low of a level all right so that's how it moves but then what does stop do so stop is actually more like decelerate, uh, where with the, if it's within a certain absolute error range, you can just say that it's at rest. Otherwise, if it's greater or less than zero, you're gonna make it increment slowly up or down until it gets to zero and is at rest. So you could kind of see it in my demo that it's slowed down a bit. You would notice it a lot more if I didn't have this and it just stopped precisely when my finger left the key. So speaking of keys, let's take a look at how these are triggered. So we have keyboard functions. Like I said, OpenGL does handle interfacing with the hardware for us. But all we have to do is say, if the key is equal to W, then the speed minus equals a constant that I defined as acceleration. So right now it's 0.1. And same here, this is 0.1 in the other direction. And then we set is moving to be true. Now I could take is moving out and just put it below these two, but we might want to have other keys that do completely different things. So I'll just keep them there. But always think about how you can encapsulate things. If you see code more than once, most likely it doesn't need to be there more than once. Okay, and then we have a keyboard up function. So keyboard down is when we're pressing on the key. If we press and hold, it'll keep on uh, accumulating the acceleration. And then as soon as we let up on the key, is moving is set to false. And then every frame, see, once it's not moving, every frame, it'll call stop. 
and it'll reset it back to zero slowly. Okay, so we know how to move it, how that was triggered, and then this is just simple OpenGL thing. Once again, we have a constant zoom speed and we just move it in and out. That's pretty basic. You can look on my GitHub for all of these specific stuff that I'm just kind of brushing over. Uh, but then finally, this is our display function. So this is where the zoom is being scaled. This is where we call our draw cube. So it draws the cube every frame. You know how we update all these vertices? Well, it redraws all of the vertices every frame. And then this is particularly important, and I'd recommend you look this up and really understand it. It's called the look at vector. And basically, if you saw my graphics video, you would see there's a diagram where it showed your eye position as the person viewing the screen. And then the eye was going to a specific point in your 3D field. And then you had another vector defining up. But this is really important to understand how your camera works and how you're going to be manipulating vectors to rotate it. So that's what I wanted to talk about now. That was really all there was to the little thing I made, but this is where you can put, so for example, we have this move camera function. I was about to make a function that would have the camera follow the block so we could kind of watch it go on its diagonal scrolling adventure, but it would also be a fun challenge to make the camera go into third or first person. You could toggle it. You could have what I was saying before, where you move your cursor and the WASD to move around like most modern games. This is all very possible. And then also uh, we want to define rotation. So this is where we would define the rotation. We'd have the new direction. And instead of just setting it to cube forward, we'd multiply this by some rotation ma matrix. And I'm not gonna show you guys how to do that because I think it's really valuable to learn and do things on your own. I did most of this just from Stack Overflow and OpenGL documentation. Some of you may find this complicated and a little overwhelming. Others may find it simple and manageable. But the point is, is that this is a starting point. So I've already mentioned some other suggestions. We talked about all the things we could do with the camera, but now let's extract all of these into the appropriate modules. Think about how Unity and Unreal and all of those engines have like physics. They have an object manager. They have a memory manager. And then under physics and under all of those, there are all these subcategories. You can kind of start to plan it out and see all the different ways this can go. I found that when you're just starting to code and make games for the first time, the hardest part is just getting something to appear on your screen that you can interact with. And so I hope this was a decent start if you had no idea where to go. And I hope I gave you some ideas and some things to Google. Definitely tweet at me or leave me a comment if you've decided to make an engine of your own. But until then, have a happy day wherever you are. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.